Ahmed Anfar from the IDC, and he's going to get directly into um, Turkish-Iranian relations and whether there's a possible Cold War. Um, Mayor Javad Anfar is an Iranian, Israeli, Middle East analyst. He teaches contemporary Iranian politics um, at the IDC in Herzliya. And he's also co-author, no mention of your co-author, <laughs> yeah. of uh, uh, Ahmadinejad's biography, The Nuclear Sphinx of Tehran. So, Mayor. Thank you very please. much. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody, and uh, great to be here with you. Apologies about the delay. It seems that the taxi company completely forgot about me. But anyway, made it in time, and thank you very much for the invitation, Galia, and for arranging everything. Appreciate it very much. Um, Professor Bashar Balaban, you, didn't, you were starting to get into dangerous territory because you were talking about Iran and Turkey, which is uh, something very interesting. I'm glad you gave the <clears throat> introduction to that because Israel was not the only loser from Mavi Marmara. Iran was the second biggest loser from Mavi Marmara. Um, we saw in Israel, of course, the tension that it created. It also rang alarm bells, that Mavi Marmara incident because that was the start of where the Iranian regime started to notice that Turkey under Erdogan is starting to steal their thunder. <clears throat> Iran for many years has been saying that uh, Israel should be wiped out, we should help the Palestinian people, but you know Iran has been very powerful and has been very active with words. In action, we have never seen an Iranian flotilla. We've never seen the Iranians getting directly involved. Whereas we saw the Turks, although there's debate about whether Mavi Marmar was from the Turkish government or wasn't, but still, uh, what really upset the Iranians and made them feel threatened was that they saw that actually the Turks were willing to send a ship and to challenge the Israeli navy to get the Mavi Marmara onto Gazan shores. And then, of course, nine people were killed on that, and we saw the world reaction to that. Uh, if there had been nine Iranian activists on an Iranian ship being shot by Israeli commandos, the Iranians realized that the re reaction would, not have been, would have been different, let's just put it that way. But the reaction which the Turks got was, was quite amazing. And Iran basically saw that Turkish soft power was stealing Iran's thunder away. Iran had, for years, had provided movements such as Hamas and Jihad Islami with billions of dollars of money in order to establish itself as a player in Gaza in, in order to win the soft war, soft power war in Gaza. But all it took was one tourist ship from Turkey to basically steal thunder of Iran away. We saw that all of a sudden there were Turkish flags in Gaza after Mavi Marmara. I don't remember any Iranian flags in Gaza. There were people naming themselves after Prime Minister Erdogan after Mavi Marmara. Nobody called their children Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, but then again, nobody in Iran does it anyway. So you can understand that one. <laughs> Another source of the tension uh, between, uh, between the two countries, which we saw as, of course, developed is Syria. Um, I remember during the Turkey-Brazil deal, the, you know, the, uh, the Iran and the, um, Iran and Turkey were very close alongside President Lula of, of Brazil. Um, I actually think the Turkish government went too far with that deal. That deal was unacceptable, and we have to thank President Obama for not signing it. There were two clauses in that deal which basically made it impossible, and, 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 and something that should have been rejected, which thankfully was. One of them was that President Prime Minister Erdogan and Mr. Lula expected uh, President Obama to endorse a deal which would basically recognize Iran's right to enrich uranium. This is without Iran answering any questions to the IAEA. This is without Iran asking, without Iran allowing extra access to uh, its suspected site, without Iran having to um, suspend and enrich uranium, nothing. This is something that we're very grateful that Pre Prime President Obama saw and rejected. That I was, uh, it was quite shocking that this is something that the Brazilian and the Turkish government expected of the United States. Another clause of that deal was that Prime Minister Erdogan and Mr. Lula expected uh, the, the deal, basically, for the Americans to endorse a clause in the deal, which meant that once the enriched uranium leaves Iranian territory and goes to Turkey, the only country that can recall it at any time is Iran. 
So what's the point of transferring it into Turkey? You might as well, the, the uranium stay in Iran. And of course that was the honeymoon. That was the honeymoon of the, of the period between Iran and Turkey. Uh, I remember Ayatollah Khamenei, the Iranian uh, Supreme Leader at one point talking about a new axis formed between Iran, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, which of course that was in 2009, and we see how that's been falling apart. Syria has been crucial. Syria has been a crucial um, arena where Iran and Syria have fallen apart for reasons that I'm sure you're aware of. The Iranians don't want Bashar al-Assad to fall because of domestic reasons. The biggest reason why Iran doesn't want Bashar al-Assad to fall is for domestic reasons. The reason being that between all of the Middle Eastern countries, the one country that the Iranian public, and I emphasize the term the Iranian public, knows best is Syria. I remember, you know, I, I uh, went to Iran uh, to school till the age of 14, and one year I had the pleasure of uh, attending a Muslim school, and the other years I was in a Jewish school, but one year I was in a Muslim school, which was absolutely wonderful, unforgettable. It was wonderful, I was treated great. Um, and, you know, I remember some of my school friends had to attend Quran competitions. I didn't have to, and they, they envied me for not having to, but they were frog marched into having to attend Quran competitions and learning it by heart. And the winner was free trip to Syria. You know, I don't know, there's no Disneyland in Syria. There was Hazrat Zainab in, in, in Damascus, which is very beautiful. But this, these were all subsidized trips. The government, the, the best worker in Ministry X would go to Syria. The, you know, the best teacher, Syria. It was just subsidized trip. It was, the, it was the Ibiza of the Islamic Republic, in a way. The party capital of, of, of the Iranian government. So when people know this country so well, you've got that affinity of being the number one. Number two, many Iranians worked in Syria. There's been many projects in Syria that the Iranians, hundreds of thousands of Iranians worked. In fact, Syria is one of the only countries which where Iranian cars are manufactured. And even more amazing is that it's cheaper to buy an Iranian samand in Syria than it is in Iran. Because the Syrians give uh, the Iranian uh, manufacturers a tax break. So when you got all that, the high number of population who've visited, and the, those who've worked, and of course the Syrian regime looks similar to the Iranian regime, more or less, because of what they call the axis of resistance against Israel and the United States. If Syria falls, what are people in Iran going to think? They're going to think, hang on a minute, the Syrians could do it, maybe we could as well. Which is something that really scares the Iranian government, which is why the Iranian government is standing by Bashar al-Assad. This is the biggest reason, of course there are other reasons as well. And this has created great rift with Turkey, um, for understandable reasons, Turkey's got its own, um, its own priorities. But of course this is costing Iran an arm and a leg financially, and of course in terms of its legitimacy. So some people ask me, so why don't the Iranians just dump Assad? Why, why are they... It's like going to a betting shop every day and betting on that three-legged horse that you know is going to lose. Why do the Iranians keep betting on the three-legged horse that's called Bashar al-Assad? It's because of the domestic issue. It's because the Iranian regime doesn't want to set a precedent for the Iranian people. Because if Bashar al-Assad falls, that will be the biggest precedent of the Arab Spring that could affect Iran. And this is something that Iran will continue to do so, will continue to support Bashar al-Assad, and that's going to continue to create differences with, uh, with Turkey over this matter. Then, of course, we have the issue of the Kurds in, um, in, in Turkey and, and Iraq. There have been some reports that Iran had been cooperating, limited cooperation with, with PKK in some instances, although in other areas they have been cooperating with Turkey, but there are some differences. Also, um, there's if, uh, issues over Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, Iran, you know, the third Shiite country in the world, third biggest in terms of population. First is Iran, second is Iraq, third is Azerbaijan. So in the Armenia versus Azerbaijan conflict, Iran supports <coughs> Armenia. There goes the Islamic Republic, those fundamentalists. They support Armenia. The Iranians don't want to see a strong Azerbaijan because they're worried that if Azerbaijan becomes strong, then our own Azerbaijan is in Iran. We have two provinces. 
and the third one, Ardabil, which they split off because they didn't want, they want to divide the Azerbaijanis, would join them. So there's differences over that as well. Iran has got very good relations with, uh, with Armenia. Although, I must say, in a very interesting instance, Mr. Ahmadinejad visited Armenia, but he refused to go to the site which the Armenians have created in commemoration of the one and a half hour, uh, million Armenians who died in the 1920s, he refused to go there. But what is the fundamental differences between these two countries? This is before I get to the next question of whether it's going to be Cold War. What are the fundamental differences between Iran and Turkey of today? First and foremost, Turkey is a democratic country. Turkey is an Islamic democracy. Iran is an Islamic dictatorship. Fundamental differences. Turkey is a member of NATO. Its economy is growing. Its exports are growing. Its influence is growing. Iran is a country that's under sanctions, that's losing more friends every day. And of course, the worst issue for the Iranian government, and this is the biggest danger that Turkey poses to Iran, the biggest danger, is that Turkey is becoming an example that Iranian people want to follow. They look at Turkey and say, hang on, in Iran some people say, well, if there's democracy, people are going to push us out. Those in Iran who want democracy point to Turkey and say, no, we can have a system like Turkey. You, the Islamists, can stand next to the secularists, you can stand next to the, those who believe there should be less, moderate Islamists, moderate secu secularists, everybody can stand together. In fact, today, Turkey is becoming a very successful um, soft power in Iran. The Turkish model for the Iranian people is becoming very soft, very, very successful soft power example. And here I have to, uh, of course, refer to, the, to an issue of, which is cultural, you know, um, as well as Israeli, I'm, I'm, I'm Persian, I come from a two and a half thousand year old uh, Persian um, culture and, and the nationality. You know, every nationality has got its own complexities. In Iran, we suffer from, at the same time, simultaneously, from a superiority complex and inferiority complex. It's amazing. Uh, we, uh, we feel inferior to the Europeans. This is why we had this concept of Qab Zadegi, you know, which means those people who are um, overtaken or are, are submissive to the Western culture because we feel inferior to the Western powers. But at the same time, we feel superior to all the other countries around us. Um, we feel superior to the Arabs, and of course we feel superior to the Turks. And in Iran, all the jokes about, uh, you know, um, people who have difficulty understanding or intellectually challenged, we say it about the Turks. So it's amazing that, you know, today, for any Persian, we have to go to, go to Turkey and to realize that the jokes should be said about us, really, because look at their country and look at our country. Look at where Turkey is today, look at where Iran is today. Turkey has been far more successful, and I, and I think if there's going to be a revolution in Iran, the Kemalist, the Kemalist example is going to be one of the most popular in Iran to follow. Because people are sick to the back tooth of abuse of power by the Islamic, uh, by the Islamic uh, powers in Iran, and, and the Turkish example, which has been very successful in mixing first um, religion and democracy, and then of course prior to that, the, the, the secularist model, is, is uh, becoming more popular. So I have to really say it's very impressive the soft power that Turkey has in Iran today without really having to do much. Now the issue is here, are the countries going to become involved in a Cold War? Um, I would say no. What we're going to see is competition, intense competition between the two countries, but it's not going to be Cold War. Um, we're going to see, of course, the competition in places such as Syria and Iraq, where Turkish companies have been very successful recently in, uh, in getting contracts in Iraq and have been stealing Iran's thunder uh, in Iraq um, and are doing extremely well. Um, but, you know, this is not going to lead to a, to a Cold War for a number of reasons. Turkey and Iran have many common interests. Still, the regime has common interests. Uh, the issue of uh, gas, and, uh, gas and oil, we still sell gas and oil from Iran to Turkey. The Turks have tried to uh, find alternative to Iranian oil, but Libyan oil is not the same quality. Um, they're still trying to find some negotiations with the Saudis, but they have not been able to replace 
the, the quality of Iranian oil uh, that, that they have been trying to get from other places. So all they've done for now is to replace 20% uh, of oil from Iran with other oil uh, suppliers. And of course, I don't expect Turkey to give any uh, any uh, to give up its gas contract with Iran because the Turks. This is really got to really got to admire Prime Minister Erdogan. He went and concluded a deal with Iran, a gas deal, when Iran was, was at its lowest in terms of its uh, in terms of its isolation. So Turkey gets lower than market prices gas from Iran, although sometimes it's intermittent and sometimes unexplained explosions. Um, the supply has been usually good and Turkey buys its gas from Iran at a very reasonable price and I don't expect the Turkish government to be giving that up at any time. Um, then there's a, whoop, there we are. My time is up. I've got two minutes, I understand. You have, you have five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, there we are. Thank you very much. Um, then there's, of course, the issue of the, Ira the Kurds. Uh, Turkey and Iran have differences over the, the issue of Kurds. However, I think the two countries are, it's in their interest to continue uh, cooperating with each other. And this is something that's going to make sure that the Turks don't, uh, and the Turks and the Iranians don't get uh, involved in, um, in, in a Cold War. And as I said, it's the issue of the economy. It's very important. The two countries have very ex extensive economic uh, uh, relations. Um, in 2002, when Mr. Erdogan came to power, uh, the volume of trade between Iran and Turkey was $2 billion. Um, today it's $17 billion. This is something very important for Turkish uh, market. Um, and I remember, of course, in, uh, during the war in Iran, my father used to have a uh, pharmacy in Tehran. And at that time, not many companies were willing to, countries were willing to sell to Iran. So the majority of all the soaps and the shampoos and everything else that we had uh, were actually Turkish products. And Turkey found a very good market uh, in Iran during the war, and, and I expect that this is going to continue. The two countries are not, I don't think they are going to uh, cross the red line of, um, um, red, red, red line of, uh, of uh, Cold War. This is despite Turkey snobbing, snobbing Iran. Uh, we saw that the recent non-aligned movement in Iran, which the, the, there was a conference and Iran was making a huge uh, deal about it. Well, the Turkish Prime Minister did not only just turn, he didn't turn up, number one. He went to United Nations and he was slamming Iran's uh, ally, Syria. Instead of being in Tehran and being nice to the Iranians who invited him, he didn't even turn up. He went there. But still, the Iranians are very careful. Um, the Iranians are um, applying what I think in Turkish, please excuse my Turkish accent here. What do you call in Turkey? Akizda Bagla is Islatmar? That's it. Sorry, it's my Persian Turkish accent. It's not very good. You should hear it when I speak Hebrew. Basically means uh, not being direct because, you know, uh, why? Because you have a baklava in your mouth, so you don't want to say something directly. So not speaking directly. At that point, I would like to ask uh, all Israeli politicians to have a baklava in their mouth because uh, they speak too much and maybe you know, they should uh, restrain themselves and, and try to, uh, to speak with a little bit more uh, nuance. So uh, more Turkish baklava, please. Um, but, I'm not, but I must emphasize before I finish, it's not going to be easy for Khamenei to, uh, to contain the forces who wants this, uh, the, con the, the strategy of not getting involved in a, in a cold war with Turkey to succeed. In Iran, there are competing forces. The IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, is much more hostile towards Turkey. They threatened Turkey after Turkey agreed to install um, an anti-missile system on its soil, an anti-NATO anti-missile system. Which, are, which will protect the citizens of the State of Israel, by the way. So uh, although we have our differences with Mr. Erdogan, I really don't understand how people can call him the enemy of the State of Israel when he has installed missiles on Turkish soil, NATO missiles, that will protect us if Iran starts firing missiles at us. Um, and of course, and of, and of course we have the issue of the, um, this sort of Iranian government threatened that. Um, and of course that was the IRGC, then the, the IRGC have also had a bad relationship with Turkey over the construction of Imam Khomeini airport when they expelled the Turks. And, and of course Turks sell lost its license in Iran because again the IRGC expelled the Turks. And recently Turkey um, accused 10 people on its soil of spying for Iran. These are all the IRGC basically 
trying to um, take a more aggressive line with Turkey, but at the same time we have the Iranian foreign policy mechanism, which is far more for, much against that is and is make, trying to make sure that Iran doesn't want to be, that Iran doesn't become involved in another unnecessary conflict, because as we see what with what is happening to Iran, the regime is becoming more isolated than ever. Thank you.